Hello dear students and welcome back to K Gupta's online lecture series. In this particular video, we are going to talk about psychoanalytical criticism. We are going to discuss what is psychoanalytical criticism and then we are going to discuss about the structure of human psyche, then Oedipus complex. We are going to talk about Sigmund Freud's Carl Jung, Alfred Adler, Ernest Jones, Jacques Lacan, Julia Kristeva, Luce Irigray, and Slok Jajek. So we are going to talk about all these thinkers and their theories and what are the opinions of these thinkers about psychoanalytical criticism about human psyche. So let us start psychoanalytical criticism. Psychoanalytical criticism is a form of literary criticism which uses some of the techniques of psychoanalysis in the interpretation of literature. So we are talking about psychoanalytical criticism about the techniques of psychoanalysis in interpretation of literature, how it is important to interpret the literature in the perspective of the human mind, human psychology, human psyche and the interpretation of literature. Psychoanalysis itself is a form of therapy which aims to cure mental disorders by investigating the interaction of conscious and unconscious elements in the mind. So at the beginning it was used as a therapy which we are going to investigate and which we are going to uh, investigate the disorder and having the interaction between conscious and unconscious mind elements in the mind. The classic method of doing this is to get the patient talk freely in such a way that the repressed fears, conflicts which are causing the problems are brought into the conscious mind and openly faced rather than remaining buried in the unconscious. So as a therapeutic use, they are going to investigate between conscious and unconscious minds and that patient you, that they made this patient to talk freely about what is the repressed thing in his mind. It may be fear or it may be conflict that may be in his mind and that can cause the problem and that are brought into the conscious mind and that he that this theory wants that patient should face these problems openly rather than remaining these things buried in his unconscious. Then only he can be cured. This practice is based upon specific theories of how the mind, the instinct and sexuality work. These theories were developed by the Australian psychologist Sigmund Freud. These are growing agreement today that the therapeutic value of the method is limited and that Freud's life work is seriously flawed by methodological irregularities. All the same, Freud remains a major cultural force and his impact on how we think about ourselves has been incalculable. So this practice is based upon the theories that how our mind works, how the instincts and sexuality work. And Sigmund Freud has made the impact on 
the language, literature, art, sculpture, and so many things which can be discussed here. Especially we are discussing about literature, psychoanalysis and literature, interpretation of the literature. And Freud remains a major cultural force and there is an impact on how we think about ourselves has been incalculable. All of Freud's work depends upon the notion of unconscious, which is a part of mind beyond consciousness, which nevertheless has a strong influence upon our actions. So according to him, that unconscious is a part of our mind and that is beyond our consciousness and it has a strong influence upon our actions. What is important? Action is important but for that action unconscious is responsible so that unconscious has a strong influence upon our actions according to Sigmund Freud. Freud was not the discoverer of unconscious. His uniqueness lies in his attributing to it such a key role in our lives. Linked with this is the idea of repression, which is the forgetting or ignoring of unresolved conflicts, unadmitted desires or traumatic past events so that they are forced out of conscious awareness and into the realm of unconscious. So he says that we have so many things in our mind that may be unresolved conflict and unadmitted desire. It may be traumatic past event. So we repress these things and these things are forced into in the part of mind which is the realm of unconsciousness. So these ideas, these the, this is the idea of repression where we repress conflicts, desires and traumatic past events. But these are there, these things are there in the mind itself. A similar process is that of sublimation whereby the repression material is promoted into something grand or is disguised as something noble. For instance, sexual urges may be given sublimated expression in the form of instance religious expression or longings. So there is a process of sublimation. The repressed things can be expressed through disguised, through disguised things, through our actions, through our thinking. For instance, sexual urges may be given sublimated expression in the form of intense religious experiences or longings. So these things are there and that can be expressed somewhere. It may be through our actions or it may be through our art. It may be expressed through literature. So the idea of repression is there and the idea of sublimation is there. Though the things are there that can be repressed in our mind, that can be, there, there can be the sublimation that can be expressed in a way, in some way, so that we, there can be the expression through art and literature or action or our language. Later in his career, Freud suggested a three-part model of the psyche divided into the ego, superego and the it. These three levels of the personality roughly corresponding to respectively 
the consciousness, the conscience and the unconscious. So what is that the mind has been modeled in three parts. So it is called a three part model of psyche. And that is been divided, that has been divided into ego, super ego and it by Sigmund Freud. And that ego is the consciousness, super ego is conscience and the id is unconscious. So what is the structure of human psyche? Freud distinguished three components of human psyche. According to Sigmund Freud, there are three components of human psyche. First is the ego. There can be questions on these three components of human psyche. So listen carefully. The ego. The ego is the conscious mind which we work with, use and are most aware of. It meditates between the conscious it and the superego. It is the source of our decision making and our rational thought. So it can be asked, what is ego? The ego is conscious mind. Okay, simply ego is the conscious mind. And we work with the conscious mind. Everyone works with the conscious mind. And we are, most of the people are aware of the conscious mind. What is there in our mind? We are conscious about it. And this ego meditates between super ego and it. It meditates between the unconscious and the id between these two things super ego and it it meditates between these two and this ego is the source of our decision making there can be question what is the source of decision making the ego is the source of decision making and our rational thoughts all rational thoughts comes from these thought, rational thought comes from the ego. So ego is also important thing because our mind works with our decisions are there and it is a source of our decision making and our rational thought. Then second component of our human psyche is the super ego. The super ego is what can be called our conscience. Super ego is not consciousness, but it is conscience. It is drawn from social setting and cultural codes. Conscience or super ego is drawn from the social setting, cultural codes and influences the way the conscious works. It influences how the conscious work. So, the super ego is nothing but it is a conscience. It is drawn from the social settings, cultural codes, social code of conduct and influences the way the conscious work. It influences to the conscious. It influences to the ego. And third part of the human psyche is the it. The id is Freud's favorite territory and that is the area of instincts, dreams and desires and all that does not come to the fore in our consciousness. It is the unconsciousness or it is unconscious. So the id or unconscious is the favorite territory of Sigmund Freud. There can be that multiple choice question. What is the favorite territory of Sigmund Freud? The id is the favorite territory of Sigmund Freud. It is the area of instinct. The id is the area of instinct, dreams and desires. 
so we have our dreams instincts and desires in this component of our human psyche and we sometimes don't allow these desires to come forth in our consciousness and this is always there in unconscious there is these things are there always in the unconscious mind or in the id this component of human psyche freud proposed that human psyche has an area into which go all those desires and fantasies that cannot be expressed so there are so many desires and there are so many our wishes that cannot be expressed which are there our fantasies are there our desires are there in our human psyche and in the human psyche it has an area in which all these desires are there fantasies are there and we cannot express these desires these fantasies we keep these desires and fantasies in one component of our human psyche of our human mind this area he termed the unconscious the process through which certain desires especially sexual are pushed into unconscious so that they do not influence our daily lives and our conscious mind is called repression and so these desires these fantasies these are there in unconscious he termed it he termed this component of our human psyche as unconscious sigmund freud called it the human psyche where these desires are there which cannot be expressed are there in unconscious aise ek hamari ichhaye hoti hai hamari kuch fantasies hoti hai jisko hum zahir nahi kar sakte wo hamare dimag ke is unconscious is kone mein hum rakhte hai jisko hum kabhi express nahi kar sakte ya nahi karte but these desires especially sexual are pushed into unconscious or aise desires especially sexual desires are pushed into this component or this compartment of human psyche so that they do not influence our daily lives we do not allow unconscious or these sexual desires our fantasies to influence our daily lives and our conscious mind that is called repression so we repress these sexual desires fantasies and uh, the things we cannot express these are repressed into that compartment of the mind that is called unconscious freud himself described the concept of repression as the cornerstone of psychoanalytic theory so what is the cornerstone according to sigmund freud to describe this concept of repression to the concept of repression that it is the cornerstone of psychoanalytical theory the concept of repression is the cornerstone of psychoanalytical theory इस थेरी की आधारशिला क्या हो सकती है तो वो है ये जो रिप्रेशन हम जो हमारे भावनाएं हैं उसका दमन करके हमारे दिमाग में रखते हैं वो जो दमन है दट इज कॉल्ड द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ रिप्रेशन वो हमारे दिमाग में है जिसको हम एक जगह बंद करके रखते हैं उसको अनकॉन्शियस कहते हैं उस जगह को and that is the concept of repression where we repress our desires our fantasies especially sexual desires etc repression is the hiding away of something in our mind what is hidden away 
exist in our unconscious. So repression is hiding something into our mind. What is hidden and that exists in our mind, in the part, in the compartment of our mind that is unconscious. For example, what we repress, the guilt inducing desire, the traumatic event such as death of a loved one, abuse. These are quickly shunned out of the conscious and relegated into the unconscious to emerge only in particular moment. So what we repress, we repress the guilt inducing desire. Aisi ichha jo hume guilty feeling karti hai. Some traumatic events, kuch hadsa hai. For example, death of loved one, kisi humare bohut aziz vekti ka koi dehant ho gaya hai. To usko hum, usko ne mein, uski jo smriti hai, usko hum chupa ke rakte hai, usko zahir honne nahi dete, kyunke hume utna hi dhuk hota hai. Koi abuse ho, कोई ऐसी घटना हो जिस जो हमें अच्छी नहीं लगती उसको हम शंड आउट करते हैं वी क्विकली शंड आउट वी थ्रो इट इनटू द अनकॉन्शियस माइंड वी डू नॉट लेट इट कम इनटू द कॉन्शियस एंड वी रिलेगेटेड इट इनटू द कॉन्शियस अनकॉन्शियस टू इमर्ज only in particular moments. We allow it to emerge only in particular moments. These are not allowed always, but at some times, especially in particular moments, we allow these things to emerge. The conscious is the greatest threat to our identity as rational humans. Thus, forbidden desires that if expressed can lead to guilt are shut away in unconscious through repression. So conscious is supposed as the greatest threat to our identity as rational humans. So always uh, we repress the things, forbidden desires, guilt-inducing desires that can be shut away into unconscious through repression. Aise chizo ko hum, in chizo ko hum daman karke, us humare dima ke us kone mein usko rakhte hai, jo kabhi kabhi, kabhi kabar wo bahar nikalta hai in a particular moment. However, what is repressed does not always repress. The unconscious emerges in particular moments as image, dreams, jokes and art or ye jo cheeze hai always that repressed is not always repressed that does not always repressed jisko hum daman karke jisko humne chupa kar rakha hai wo hamesha ke liye chupta nahi hai the unconscious emerges in particular moment through images through dreams through jokes through an art तो ये कला साहित्य हमारे तस्वीरों से या हमारे मजाक में से हमारे सपनों में से वो कभी कभी जाहिर होता है द साइको एनालिस्ट एक्सप्लोर दीज इमेजेस एंड अनकवर्स दो डिजायर दैट है फॉर लिटरे क्रिटिसिजम इट इज एन इम्पॉर्टेंट इन साइट फ्रॉइड वॉज proposing that art draws upon the unconscious for its theme and images. Or, ye jo psychoanalysis hai, ye isme jo kaha gaya hai ki jisko daman karke humare dimaag ke is kone mein usko chupa kar rakha hai, wo kabhi kabhi bahar nikalta hai, humare tasmiro se, humare sahitya se, humare achet man ki ye jo bhaunaye hai, वो जाहिर होती है छबियों से तस्वीरों से कला से साहित्य से एंड 
that psychoanalyst expo explores these images. They want to uncover those desires that have been repressed or jisko kisi ne daba kar rakha hai, chupa kar rakha hai, daman kar ke rakha hai, jo sahitya mein hai, usko uncover karne ke koshish karte hai, usko adhyan karne ke koshish karte hai. And for literary criticism, this is an important site that Sigmund Freud was proposing that art draws upon the unconscious. Or Sigmund Freud ke hisab se kisi bhi kala ka jo mool hai, wo hamara unconscious mind hai. Jis mein se ye jo images nikalti hai, ya kuch art ya literature nikalta hai, uska jo mool hai, wo hai unconscious in ke hisab se Sigmund Freud thinks like that. Human life for Sigmund Freud is caught in the tensions generated by two basic principles. One is pleasure principle. What is pleasure principle? The pleasure principle is one where all our acts are governed by need to attain pleasure and avoid unpleasure. That we want, everyone want pleasure and everyone tries to avoid un unpleasure. So this is the pleasure principle that everyone longs for the pleasure and our acts are governed by the need to attain pleasure. So this is the pleasure principle where everyone, uh, the actions of everyone are governed by the pleasure and everyone tries to avoid unpleasure. And second is that the reality principle. What is reality principle? That Reality principle enables us to understand that our pleasures cannot be fulfilled the way we want them. It tells them, the reality principle tells us that the pleasure we want cannot be fulfilled in a particular way, the way we want it. And therefore, it inspires us to seek other route to attain the pleasure. And reality principle inspires us to seek the other route, the other way to attain the pleasure. And it tells us it cannot be fulfilled in the way we want it. Sexuality. Sexuality is a prime drive in our subjectivity, according to Freud. He termed this the libido. The problem is, according to Freud, not all sex drives or desires can be put into operation. Therefore, what gets repressed primarily is the sex drive. An individual's sexual identity is here partly the result of expression of desires and partly the condition caused by a repression of the same. In order to explain this, Freud developed the idea of Oedipus complex. So, what is the prime drive? Sexuality is the prime drive, according to Sigmund Freud. And he termed it, that sexual drive, he terms it as a libido. And the problem, according to Freud, not all is not all uh, sex drives or desires can be put into operation and every type of desire is not problematic but sometimes uh, some some type of desires can be problematic and for that he gives an idea of the concept of oedipus complex so the oedipus complex many of freud's ideas concern aspects of sexuality Infantile sexuality, for instance, is the notion that sexuality begins not at puberty with physical maturing, but in infancy, especially through the infant's relationship with the mother. So, he talks about the aspects of sexuality and he thinks that the child is not getting the ideas of, about sexuality at the puberty, at the maturity, but he gets the sexuality 
at the beginning of the life that is at the infancy and especially through the infant's relationship with the mother and he is aware of that sexuality uh, through infant's relationship with mother. This is the controversial thing but uh, this is the main thing of the Oedipus complex and connected with this is the Oedipus complex whereby says Freud the male infant conceives the desire to eliminate the father and become the sexual partner of mother. We use Oedipus complex with the great degree of ease today and indeed it is a part of everyday language now. The notion of Oedipus complex evolved out of an analysis situation described by ancient Greek playwright Sophocles of the Greek king Oedipus who killed his father and married his mother. Without being aware of the true nature of either of acts. Critical interpretations of the play yielded theory of human psyche and proved to be one of the most widely known and controversial intellectual ideas of the 20th century. So what is Oedipus complex? That is uh, taken from the Greek playwright Sophocles Oedipus that the character is there, the Greek king Oedipus is there, who killed his father to get married with his mother and he was not aware of the true nature of his actions. So it is that Oedipus complex is about that uh, infant, especially a male child has the attraction towards his mother and that has been discussed in Oedipus complex and that is critical interpretations of the play of this particular play yielded the theory of human psyche proved that to be one of the most widely known and controversial intellectual idea of the 20th century. This may be the uh, controversial uh, idea of 20th century but nowadays uh, that Oedipus complex we discuss with a great ease today and indeed it is a part of everyday language and uh, that he says that Sigmund Freud says that male infant conceives the desire to eliminate the father and become the sexual partner of the mother. For Freud the problem with sexual desires begins with the child's dependence on mother. The love for mother is the dominant theme in child psyche in early years. Soon the child begins to see his father as rival for mother's love. The father restricts the child's expression of love through a threat, a threat that child imagines of castration. The male child imagines that the girl child lacks penis because she has been castrated because of her excessive love for mother. The child therefore begins to develop fantasies of killing his father so that he will have no rivals for his mother's love. This fantasy is what Freud famously called the Oedipus complex. Now this is the Oedipus complex where a male child thinks that a female girl child lacks penis because she has been castrated. She has been castrated by father because of uh, her excessive love for uh, her mother. And therefore he thinks that he should kill his father so that he will not have the rival for his mother's love. And this fantasy is called Oedipus complex by Sigmund Freud. Soon this child sees the father as possessing the greater authority. This makes the shift in affiliation. The child now seeing father as the source of all power and desire. Shifts his focus, this child shifts his focus to the father. The desire for mother is shut away in the unconscious when the child accepts the law that you should you should not make love to your mother. This law becomes 
the threshold of conscious and unconscious so afterwards this child understands that the father possesses the authority and he accepts the law that he should not make love with his mother and he becomes conscious and he becomes uh, the conscious but the unconscious uh, thing is there the love about his mother is there in the unconscious mind and this is the law uh, on the threshold of conscious and unconscious the process is more complicated with girls though as infants their libido is directed towards the mother they cannot hope to fulfill this wish as they distinguish that they lack penis the girls then develop penis envy and develop hostility towards their mothers for depriving them of a penis they cannot identify themselves with either their mother or fathers they redirect their libido toward towards their fathers which begins the process of identification with their mothers and their identity formation as a woman what follows is a stage called latency where no sexual activity occurs and emphasis is on cognitive and social development at puberty the individual concentrates her sexual energy on her genital and links them with reproduction making the transition to stable sexual and emotional relationship with the opposite sex the libido and it how it develops as a as an individual grows informs the development of a human mind the failure to develop appropriately during any of a psychosexual stage results in neurosis so he uh, sigmund freud uh, he talks about the complications with the girl the process is more complicated with the girl this oedipus complex because the girl when they are infants that their libido is directed towards their mother and that they think that they don't have penis because they have been deprived by their mothers and that's why they have envy and they are hostile towards their mother and they cannot identify themselves either with their mother or father that's why they redirect their libido toward towards the father and which begins the process of identification with their mother so they identify uh, that they are uh, like their mothers and they don't have the penis and at the beginning they think that they don't have the penis because their mother deprived uh, this uh penis and that's why they think that uh in the afterwards they think that they are like their mothers and in the stage of the latency where there is there is no sexual activity occurs and the emphasis is on cognitive and social development but at the stage of puberty their individual they uh, concentrates the on their genitals and they link them with the reproduction they link their genitals with the reproduction and then they uh, try to develop they try to develop a stable sexual and emotional relationship with the opposite sex and this libido and how it develops as an individual grows informs the development of a human mind so this is uh, the thing which is responsible for the human mind and the failure to develop the appropriate uh, development of a human mind uh, of this uh, psychosexual stages results in neurosis for sigmund freud the oedipus complex is the source of all repressed desire so what is the source of oedipus complex all the repressed desires this is the source of oedipus complex the emblem of all that is repressed because even love is antagonistic in nature when triangulated between boy mother and father 
love even can be antagonistic according to sigmund freud when there is a triangle between boy mother and father the oedipus complex enabled freud to argue that all desire repression and anxiety these three things desire repression and anxiety these are based on the condition of prohibition so desire repression and anxiety these are based on condition of prohibition that is called taboo these are based upon the taboo the child never overcomes the complex but merely shuts it away so hamari ichhaye desires jo daman kiye gaye hue ichhaye hai aur hamari jo anxiety hai ye sabhi hamare jo prohibition ki sthiti hai जो नकारात्मक स्थिति है जो जिसे हमें स्वीकार नहीं किया जाता है जिसको मान्य नहीं किया जाता है प्रोहिबिट किया जाता है जो टैबू है उस पर आधारित होती है एंड दिस चाइल्ड नेवर ओवरकम्स द कॉम्प्लेक्स बट नियरली शट्स इट अवे फ्रॉइड अर्ग्यूज एज वी हैव ऑलरेडी नोटेड दैट द रिप्रेस्ड और द अनकॉन्शियस इमरजेंस इन आर्ट जोक्स और ड्रीम्स Freud analyzes he has analyzed each expression of unconscious in his career producing unusual texts for later critics Freud proposed in some of his more controversial essays that the artist is a kind of neurotic where art is a means of fulfilling otherwise ungratified desires and Sigmund Freud says that 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 so many things are been repressed these have been repressed in uh, that unconscious mind and sometimes it can be emerged through the jokes through dreams and art images freud has analyzed each expression of unconscious in his career he has produced some unusual texts for later critics and he has produced Uh, that uh, controversial essays he has written controversial essays that the artist is a kind of neurotic he thinks that artic artist is a kind of neurotic and according to him that the art is the mean art is the medium for the that artist to gratify his desires to gratify ungratified desires to fulfill ungratified desires aur us ek vyakti ko uski jo ichha akanksha hai jiska daman hua hai wo ichha purna karne ka jo ek madhyam hota hai wo shayad literature ho sakta hai chahe uske kala ho sakti hai uske dwara he can express unfulfilled desires he can express fulfilled ungratified desires he can express through uh, the art and literature through images and through his uh, whatever he has the expression through art and literature texts are read for desires they seem to conceal the kinds of drives in their characters and unconscious in them this critical move to explore the nature of human psyche by exploring the deeper hidden meaning of the text and their character is identifiable as a major critical method today one of that we can define as psychoanalytic so we read literature we read the text to identify the desires to identify the drives in the characters to identify the unconscious of the writer author and to explore through that text through that literature we want to explore the nature of human psyche and we explore the deeper hidden meaning of the text and this is the method to explore to study the literature and that that is the uh, that is called as a psychoanalytical criticism to explore 
the desires to explore the human nature, human psyche, to explore the hidden meaning of the text, to explore the characters is a critical method and that is called as a psychoanalytical criticism. Psychoanalysis developed as a discipline due to the group of followers Freud had in Vienna. He had a group of followers when he was in Vienna and notable names among these include Dr. Alfred Adler. The first image is of Dr. Alfred Adler and second image is of Dr. C. G. Jung, Carl Jung and third image is of Dr. Uh, that is Otto Rank. Freud with these friends and followers developed the Viennese Psychoanalytic Society. Adler is known for his discovery of inferiority complex. He argued that self-assertion and struggle for power dominate human behavior and that everyone in the world suffer from the inferiority complex. He did not agree with Freud's theory of sexuality and theory of Oedipus complex and soon withdrew from the group. At the beginning, Adler was with Sigmund Freud in Viennese Psychoanalytic Society. But he soon withdrew from this group because he was not agree with Sigmund Freud on the theory of sexuality. And he discover, discovered that and he proposed a theory of inferiority complex. And he argued that everyone struggles for power that dominate human behavior and that everyone in the world suffers from the inferiority complex. And that's why he was disagree with the Sigmund Freud. He was disagree with Sigmund Freud on the basis of his theory of sexuality and Oedipus complex. And that's why he withdrew from the group, Viennese psychoanalytic group. There can be a question that who had proposed who put forward the theory of inferiority complex? The answer will be Adler, who is known for his discovery of inferiority complex. Adler will be the answer. And Carl Jung was the Swiss psychiatrist who applied psychoanalytical principles to the study of schizophrenia. So the second image is of Carl Jung. He was a Swiss psychiatrist and who applied psychoanalytic principles to study schizophrenia uh, disease that is related to the mind and who worked as a close associate of Freud from 1907 to 1913. He had been with uh, Sigmund Freud from 1907, 1907 to 1913. Then he then left the psychoanalytic society and established an independent school of thought, analytical psychology. He was with Sigmund Freud for some time and then he left that psychoanalytic society and he himself established analytical psychology. He differed from Freud on matters of unconscious and sexuality. So he was, this Carl Jung was not agree with uh, Sigmund Freud on unconscious and sexuality. He proposed the term collective unconscious in place of Freud's individual unconscious. So he proposed the term collective conscious on the place of individual unconscious. He argued that the collective unconscious works as a racial memory wherein Archetypes, images, rituals, beliefs of society pass from generation to generation through genes. He thinks that these archetypes pass from generation to generation through genes. And he disagreed with Freud on sexuality, that is libido, and claimed that libido is not purely sexual. So he, uh, Carl Jung was also disagree with uh, Sigmund Freud and he developed his uh, own 
society and the name of uh, the school of thought of Carl Jung was analytical psychology and then he proposed collective unconscious. Uh, there can be a question who proposed the term collective unconscious? Carl Jung will be the answer. So Freud's method of psychoanalysis had a far reaching impact on literary studies. Freud himself, a gifted writer, wrote extensively about art and literature and analyzed some literary texts in the light of his ideas. His views on Sophocles, Oedipus Rex and Shakespeare's Hamlet are quite famous. He offered psychoanalytical examination of novella Gradiva by the German writer Wilhelm Jensen. He also wrote a paper on Dostoevsky's novel by the title Dostoevsky and Parasite and claimed that Dostoevsky depicted so many violent and murderous characters in his novels because he himself suffered from similar tendencies. Creative Writers and Daydreaming, a paper written in 1907, outlines his views on literature and literary creation from a psychoanalytic lens. He argued that writers write in order to satisfy their unsatisfied sexual desires. So this is important that he argues that the writers write because they want to, they want to satisfy uh, their unsatisfied sexual desires. And in other words, creative writing is a wish fulfillment of its author. When writers do not find means to satisfy their repressed desires, they turn away from reality and engage in fantasy, their creative writing. Freud's revolutionary psychoanalytical ideas opened up new ways to interpret literary works, but the relation between the psychoanalysis and literary criticism was firmly established by writing of British psychologist Ernest Alfred Jones. He examined famous literary works in the light of Freud's idea and ably demonstrated the application of psychoanalysis and literary studies. He wrote monographs on Keats' poems, two of Shakespeare's plays, Hamlet and Oedipus. So Ernest Jones, he make it famous and that that there is he demonstrated the application of psychoanalysis and literary studies and he wrote uh, monographs on kids poems and two Shakespeare's plays Hamlet and Oedipus. The second phase of psychoanalysis begins with the French psychoanalyst, uh, psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. He is the most influential psychoanalyst after Freud because he in, uh, reinterpreted Freud's views in the light of changing intellectual scene and enlarged its scope and the applicability by adding his own theories. So the second phase started with French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan and he enlarged the scope of psychoanalysts applying the theories of his own and apart from Freud, Lacan was influenced by Roman Jacobson, Ferdinand de Saussure and F.J. Hegel. So he was also influenced apart from Sigmund Freud, he was also influenced from by Roman Jacobson, Ferdinand de Saussure and F.J. Hegel. So there can be question that uh, Sigmund, uh, after Sigmund Freud, this Jacques Lacan was influenced by dash dash. The answer will be Roman Jacobson, Ferdinand de Saussure, and F.J. Hegel or there may be option uh, all of the above. The option will be all of the above because he was influenced by Roman Jacobson, Ferdinand de Saussure and F.J. Hegel. Uh, and uh, this can be a question. The second phase of psychoanalysis begins with dash dash. French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Contemporary theories of language attracted Lacan's attention because his study of unconscious had given him ideas similar to those used in language theories. So he was attracted, Jacques Lacan was attracted towards the language theories and he tried therefore to restate 
interpretation of unconscious in linguistic terminology and therefore he uh, reinterpreted unconscious in linguistic terminology and he had the influence of Ferdinand de Saussure and that's why uh, that perhaps the most important influence on Lacan was of Ferdinand de Saussure and he extensively references Ferdinand de Saussure to express his own on unconscious. Lacan states that there are three orders of mind, imaginary, the symbolic and the real. The imaginary order of mind is a pre-audible uh, stage in which the infant finds himself and his mother as a single body. This is an imaginary and pre-audible stage where the infant finds himself uh, similar to the body of his mother and he cannot distinguish himself from his mother and other objects in the world. So this infant cannot distinguish from mother and the other objects in the world. In other words, the infant cannot convince, uh, conceive his own self and other. So he cannot conceive his own self and other because he thinks that he is similar to the body of his mother. This is followed by symbolic order wherein the infant becomes aware of himself and the world around. This order separates him from his mother and brings him into the world of social categories. So in this stage, he is aware of himself and he is aware of the world around uh, in the social category. Gender differences and the play of language. He is aware of the social category. He is aware of gender differences and the play of language. The entry of child into the symbolic order is in fact entry into language. So this is the entry of that infant into the language. This is the symbolic entry into the language and language defines his position in a social setup and Lacan calls this the subject position. So the uh, language defines his position in social setup and this is called as a subject position. If the child is to become a part of society, he must know the system of signification called language. If that child wants to be a part of society, he must know the system of signification that is called language. In order to speak, the child must differentiate I from you. From the pronoun I, from the pronoun you, he must differentiate from I and you. The child does identifies his position with the first person singular pronoun I. So child identifies himself with the singular first person singular pronoun I and he continues to know himself in other position like he, she, boy and girl. So he knows that he is different from he, she, boy and girl. And he is first person singular pronoun that I. He knows that uh, he is pronoun is used as I and the subject position changes when you speaks to I. So this position always changes. The pronoun must be changed. It may be sometimes you and sometimes I. Somebody calls him you and he calls him I. I becomes you and you becomes I. Such reversal of subject position does not allow for fixed and permanent position to the subject and it remains in flux. So it is not permanent and fixed position. Sometimes you becomes I and I becomes you. And that's why the subject position always changes and always in flux. In Sashurin terms, the subject like the signifier always keeps changing in its position and its meaning. So it always changes like signifier. It always changes and the signified remains unattainable. Lacan believes that the unconscious is structured like language. So according to Lacan, that uh, unconscious is also like the language, that like the meaning. And that's why it works very much like language in which the repressed desires express themselves in the hope of fulfillment, but remains unfulfilled like signifier that tries to represent the signified but fail to do so entirely. And according to Lacan, that 
language is not able to fulfill unfulfilled desires like the signified signifier is not possible to signify like language as language disrupts any attempt attempt at definite meaning so in unconscious also disrupts consciousness lakan never really deals with the third order of the mind the real he considers it impossible because it is beyond the reach of signification so he never talks about the third part that is the real and as language disrupts any attempt at definite meaning so in the unconscious also disrupts consciousness and it is not possible to signify it in the same way not possible to uh, have unconscious through the literature through the language lakan never really deals with the third uh, order of the real he considers it impossible because it is beyond the reach of signification freud and lakan's theories about human psychology self sexuality and unconscious have greatly influenced many theories and critics so jacks lakan and sigmund freud's uh, theories about human psychology it may be about self about sexuality and unconscious how influenced many theorists and critics like julia kristeva and luce irigray who were influenced by lacan's writings of female sexuality kristeva and irigray both considered that sigmund freud's oedipus complex and female sexuality from the point of view of feminist point of view they reject the patriarchal thinking implicit in them so they reject and they study from the feminist point of view and they reject the patriarchal thinking in oedipus complex and the female sexuality after that in the post structural period slovenian uh, slovenian critic slovak jajek is probably the most influential psychoanalytic critic in post structural period after lacan he applied psychoanalytic theory to social and cultural topics for example he made an engaging study of marx and hegel's theories from lacanian point of view in his book the sublime object of ideology in succeeding book looking ari he offered lacanian interpretation of popular culture including films of alfred hitchcock so what are the features of psychoanalytic criticism psychoanalysis is a systematic analysis of human mind especially of the unconscious freud's general proposition was that creative writing is the product of unconscious and that object of psychoanalytical criticism is to discover the operation of this process literary work is interpreted as substitute for authors unconscious desires and drives and the job of psychoanalytic critic is to explain this process of substitution psychoanalytic critics study the linguistic and symbolic patterns in the text and attempt to reveal the subconscious motives behind the surface description psychoanalytic critics following freud's lead examine literary works in the light of concepts that he proposed like libido dream interpretation or oedipus complex these and many other concepts are applied to factors like the author text reader and characters to determine the working of the unconscious behind the creative process critics follow different strategies to examine these factors but they do not so with the common intention of unraveling the unconscious apart from freud's method of psychoanalysis carl jung's concept of collective unconscious is also applied psychoanalytic critics this method explores the relationship between the literary work and the collective unconscious which according to jung is racial memory 
through which the human spirit expresses itself. Jacques Lacan's psychoanalytical theories, heavily influenced by concepts from linguistics, are also extensively used by psychoanalytic critics. Lacan stated that unconscious was structured like language. His linking of unconscious and language, his three orders of the mind, various other concepts influenced later theorists like Julia Kristeva, Lewis Irigre, and Slovo Jajek. Dear students, after watching this video, you can draw out some MCQs through this video lecture. You can research on this topic. You can add some more points to this topic. And thank you for watching this video lecture. You can share and like this video. You can subscribe this YouTube channel for more video lectures and for more educational videos. Have a nice day.